Hello and welcome. Welcome back to Lily's at the Viking Adventures. I will be reading the Voluspa, or the Prophecy of the Siris, along with academic analysis. The source is voluspa.org, and you can follow along there if you would like. I will read it in sections, and post five stanzas with analysis at a time. I'll try to have the series finished by next weekend. I do hope it is helpful. I find that in this day and age, it is very hard to sit down with a book and just read. We are all so busy and the Norse pagan path requires study, probably more so than any other. So grab a drink, sit back and relax while I assist you in getting this important text material into your brain in the most soothing way I am able. If you appreciate my content, please consider subscribing, commenting, or liking my videos as it helps me very much. Stanza 1 through 5 Hearing, I ask, from the holy races, from Heimdall's sons, both high and low, wilt thou, Valfather, that well I relate old tales I remember of men long ago? Number two, I remember yet the giants of yore, who gave me bread in these days gone by. Nine worlds I knew, the nine in the tree with mighty roots beneath the mold. Number three, of old was the age when Ymir lived. Sea nor cool waves, nor sand there were. Earth had not been, nor heaven above, but the yawning gap and grass nowhere. Number four. Then Burr's son lifted the level land, Mithgard. The mighty, there they made the sun from the south warm the stones of earth, and green was the ground with growing leeks. Number five. The sun, the sister of the moon from the south, her right hand cast over heaven's rim. No knowledge she had where her home should be. The moon knew not what might was his. The stars knew not what their stations were. A few editors following Puke, in an effort to clarify the poem, place stanzas 22, 28, and 30 before stanzas 1 through 20. But the arrangement in both manuscripts followed here seems logical. In stanza one, the vulva, or wise woman, called upon Odin, answers him and demands a hearing. Evidently, she longs to, she belongs to the race of giants, stanza two, and thus speaks to Odin willingly, being compelled to do so by his magic power. Holy, omitted in Regius, the phrase holy races probably means little more than mankind in general. Heimdall, the watchman of the gods, stanza 46 and note. Why mankind should be referred to as Heimdall's sons is uncertain, and the phrase has caused much perplexity. Heimdall seems to have had various attributes. And in the Rig's Dula, wherein a certain Rig appears as the ancestor of the three great classes of men, a 14th century annotator identifies Rig with Heimdall. On what authority we do not know, for the Rig of this poem seems much more like Odin. R Rig Thula, introductory pose and note. Valfather, father of the slain, Odin, chief of the gods, so called because the slain warriors were brought to him at Valhall, hall of the slain, by the Valkyries, choosers of the slain. Number two, nine worlds, the worlds of the gods, Asgard, of the Wains, Vanheim, stanza 21 and note, of the elves, Alfheim, 
of men Midgarth, of the giants Jotunheim, of fire Muspelheim, stanza 47 and the note, of the dark elves Svarathelheim, of the dead Niflheim, and presumably of the dwarves, perhaps Nithalveler, stanza 37 and note, but the ninth world is uncertain. The tree, the world ash, Yildrasil, symbolizing the universe, Gremnismul, and notes, 29, 35, and notes, wherein Yildrasil is described at length. Number three, Ymir, the giant out of whose body the gods made the world. Vafru <coughs> Thinsnismol is the stanza 21 as quoted in Snorri's Edda at the first line runs Of old was the age ere aught there was yawning gap This phrase, Gnunga gap is sometimes used as a proper name Number 4 Bur's sons Uten, Vili and Vey of Bur, we know only that his wife was Bestila, daughter of Beth Bolthorn. C.F. Hovamal, 141. Vili and Vey are mentioned by name in the Edic poems only, only in Locasena. 26. Mithgard, middle dwelling, the world of men, leaks. The leek was often used as the symbol of fine growth, and it was also supposed to have magic power. 5. Various editors have regarded this stanza as interpolated. Hofori thinks it describes the northern summer night in which the sun does not set. Lines 3 to 5 are quoted by Snorri. In the manuscript, line 4 follows line 5, regarding the sun and moon, as daughter and son Mundilferi, and note and Grimsnismol, 37 and note. That is the end of this part. Please continue to follow, like, subscribe, and I will produce another one very soon. Thank you so much. Continuation of the Voluspa, stanza 6 through 10. 6. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones, and council held. Names then they gave they to noon and twilight, morning they named, and the waning moon, night and evening, the years to number. 7. At Id Havol met the mighty gods, shrines and temples. They timbered high, forges they set, and they smithied ore, tongs they wrought, and tools they fashioned. 8. In their dwellings at peace, they played at tables. Of gold no lack did the gods then know, till thither came up giant maids three, huge of might, out of Jotunheim. 9. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones and council held, to find who should raise the race of dwarfs out of Bremer's blood, and the legs of Blaine. 10. There was Motsugnir, the mightiest maid of all the dwarfs, and Durin next. Many a likeness of men they made, the dwarfs in the earth, as Durin said. Okay, so number six, possibly an interpolation but there seems no strong reason for assuming this. Lines 1 through 2 are identical with lines 1 through 2 of stanza 9. 
and line 2 may have been inserted here from that later stanza. Ethevol, Field of Deeds Mentioned only here in stanza 60 as the meeting place of the gods, it appears in no other connection. 8. Tables, the exact nature of this game, and whether it more closely resembles chess or checkers, has been made the subject of a 400-page treatise, Willard, F Willard Fisk's Chess in Iceland. Giant maids, perhaps the three great norns, corresponding to the three fates, stanza 20 and note. Possibly, however, something has been lost after this stanza, and the missing passage, replaced by the catalogue of the dwarfs, nine, stanzas 9 through 16, may have explained the great maids, otherwise than as norns. In Vrath's Huthrunismal, 49, the Norns, this time three throngs, instead, instead of simply three, are spoken of as giant maids, footnote, page 6. Fafsnismal, 13, indicates the existence of many lesser Norns belonging to various races, Jotunheim, the world of giants. 9. Here apparently begins the interpolated catalogue of the dwarfs, running through stanza 16. Possibly, however, the interpolated section does not begin before stanza 11. Snorri quotes practically the entire section, the names appearing in a somewhat changed order. Mirmir and Blaine Nothing is known of these two giants, and it has been suggested that both are names for Ymir. Stanza 3. Birmir, however, appears in stanza 37 in connection with the home of the dwarfs. Some editors treat the words as common rather than proper nouns. Birmir meaning the bloody moisture, and Blaine being of uncertain significance. Number 10. Very few of the dwarfs named in this and the following stanzas are mentioned elsewhere, except in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, where a great many of them were used verbatim for names of dwarfs and hobbit characters. It is not clear why Durin should have been singled out as authority for the list. The occasional repetitions suggest that not all stanzas of the catalog came from the same source. Most of the names presumably had some definite significance, as Northri, Suthri, Ostri, and Vestri, North, South, East, and West. Footnote, page 7. Althof, Mighty Thief, Mjothifnir, Meatwolf, Gandalf, Magic Elf, Vindolf, Wind Elf, Rathwith, Swift in Council, Exkinskjaldi, Oak Shield, but in many cases the interpretations are sheer guesswork. The Voluspa, stanza 11 through 15. 11. Nai and Nithi, Northri and Suthri, Ostri and Vestri. Oltjof, the Valen, Nar and Nain, Nipping, Dane, Bifur, Bufur, Bomber, Nuri, and Onar. I, Mjölvifnir. Twelve, Vig and Gandalf, Vendalf, Thrain, Thek and Thorin, Thorer, Vit and Lit, Nairer, and Nairath. Now have I told Regan and Rathsvith the list aright. 13. Fili, Kili, Funden, Nali, Hepti Fili, Hanar, Suvir, Frar, Hornburi, Freg, and Loni, Arving, Jari, 
Aiken Scaldi. 14. The Race of the Dwarfs In Dvalin's throng, down to Lofar, the list must I tell, the rocks they left, and through wetlands they sought a home, in the fields of sand. 15. There were Drapnir in Dorcas Thra Thrasir, Hor, Hogsbori, Elveng, Gluin, Dori, Ori, Dof, and Vari, Skirfir, Virfir, Skafith, Ai. 12. The order of the lines in this and the succeeding four stanzas varies greatly in the manuscripts and editions, and the names likewise appear in many forms. Regen, probably not identical with Regen, the son of Hreithmar, who plays an important part in the Regen Small and Fafnis Small, but CF note on Regen Small introductory prose. 14. De Wallen. In Hovamal 144, De Wallen seems to have given magic runes to the dwarves, probably accounting for their skill in craftsmanship. While Fafsni Small, 13, he is mentioned as the father of some of the lesser Norns. The story that some of the dwarves left the rocks and the mountains to find a new home on the sands is mentioned, but unexplained. In Snorri Zeta, the Lofar, we know only that he was descended from these wanderers. We start again with the Voluspa at stanza 16. 16. Alf and Yivingi, Ekin Skaldi, Fjallar and Frosty, Fith and Ginnar. So for all time shall the tale be known, the list of all the forebearers of Lofar. 17. Then from the throng did three come forth, from the home of the gods, the mighty and gracious. Two without fate, on the land they found, Ask and Imla, empty of might. 18. Soul they had not, since they had not, heat nor motion, nor goodly hue. Soul gave Othin, sense gave Hjolnir, heat gave Lothar, and goodly hue. 19. An ash I know, Ildrisil its name, with water white is the great tree wet, dense come the dews that fall in the dales, green by earth's well does it ever grow. 20. Thence come the maidens, mighty in wisdom, three from the dwelling down neath the tree. Urth is one named, Vrdanti the next. On the wood they scored and schooled the third. Laws they made here and life allotted to the sons of men and set their fates. 15. Andvari. This dwarf appears prominently in the Regia Small which tells how the god Loki treacherously robbed him of his wealth. The curse which he laid on his treasure brought about the deaths of Sigurd, Gunnar, Atli, and many others. 17. Here the poem resumes its course after the interpolated section. Probably, however, something has been lost, for there is no apparent connection between the three giant maids of stanza 8 and the three gods, Odin, Hunir, and Lothar, who in stanza 17 go forth to create man and woman. The word three in stanza 9 and 17 very likely confused some earlier reciter, or perhaps the compiler himself. Ask and Imla, Ash and Elm, Snorri gives them simply as the names of the first man and woman but says that the gods made this pair out of trees. 18. Hunir Little is known of this god save that he occasionally appears in the poems in company with Othin and Loki. And footnote P9 that he survives the destruction assuming in the new age the gift of prophecy 
stanza 63. He was given by the gods as a hostage to the Wains after their war in exchange for Nyurth, stanza 21 and note. Lothar, apparently an old name for Loki, the treacherous but ingenious son of Lofrey, Lofey, whose divinity Snorri regards as somewhat doubtful. He was adopt adopted by Uten, who subsequently had good reason to regret it. Loki probably represents the blending of two originally distinct figures, one of them an old fire god, hence his gift of heat to the newly created pair. 19. Yildressel Stands a two and note, and Grimm's Nismal, 29 through 35 and notes. Urth, the past, one of the three great norns. The world ash is kept green by being sprinkled with the marvelous healing water from her well. 20. The maidens, the three norns. Possibly this stanza should follow stanza 8. Dwelling, Regius, has se, si, instead of sal, hum, hal. And many editors have followed this reading. Although Sturi's prose paraphrase indicates sal, Yurth, Verdandi, and Skuld, past, present, and future, wood, etc., the magic signs, runes, controlling the destinies of men, were cut on pieces of wood. Lines 3 to 4 are probably interpolations of some other account of the Norns. That is the end for today. I will record another tomorrow. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. Time for another Voluspa reading. Today we do 21 through 25. 21. The war I remember, the first in the world, when the gods with spears had smitten Golvik, and in the hall of Hur had burned her, three times burned and three times born, oft and again, yet ever she lives. 22. Haith, they named her, who sought their home, the wide-seeing witch, in magic wise, minds she bewitched, that were moved by her magic, to evil women, a joy she was. 23. On the host of his spear did Othin hurl, then in the world did far war first come, the wall that girdled the gods was broken. The field by the warlike, Wains was trodden. 24. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones, and council held, whether the gods should tribute give, or to all alike should worship belong. 25. Then sought the gods their assembly seats, the holy ones, the council held, to find who with venom the air had filled, or had given oath's bride to the giant's brood. 21. This follows stanza 20 in Regis. In the Hausbach version stanzas 25, 26, 27, 40, and 41 come between stanzas 20 and 21. Editors have attempted all sorts of rearrangements. The war. The first war was that between the gods and Wains. The cult of the Wains, Vanir, seems to have originated among the seafaring folk of the Baltic and the southern shores of the North Sea, and to have spread thence into Norway in opposition to the worship of the older gods, hence the war. Finally, the two types of divinities were worshipped in common, hence the treaty which ended the war with the exchange of hostages. Chief among the Wains were Nyorth and his children, Freyr, Freya, all of whom became conspicuous among the gods. Beyond this, we know little of the Wains, who seem originally to have been water, water deities. I remember the manuscripts have she remembers, but the Volva is apparently still speaking of her own memories, as in stanza 2, Golvig, Gold Might. 
apparently the first of the Wanes to come among the gods, her ill treatment being the immediate cause of the war. Mullenhoff maintains that Gulvig is another name for Freya. Lines 5 through 6, one or both of them probably interpolated, seem to symbolize the refining of gold by fire. Kur, the High One, Uthin. 22. Shining One A name often applied to wise women and prophetesses. The application of this stanza to Golvig is far from clear, though the reference may be to the footnote, page 11 magic and destructive power of the gold. It is also possible that the stanza is an interpol interpolation. Puke maintains that it applies to the vulva who is reciting the poem, and makes it the opening stanza, following it with stanzas 28 and 30, and then going on with stanza 1. The text of line 2 is obscure and has been variously emended. 23. The stanza and stanza 24 have been transposed from the order in the manuscripts, for the former describes the battle and the victory of the Wains, after which the gods took counsel, debating whether to pay tribute to the victors or to admit them, as was finally done, to equal rights of worship. 25. Possibly, as Finn Magnuson long ago suggested, there is something lost after stanza 24, but it was not the custom of the Eddic poets to supply transitions which their hearers could generally be counted to on to understand. The story referred to in stanzas 25 and 26, both quoted by Snorri, is that the rebuilding of Asgarth after its destruction by the Wains. The gods employed a giant as builder, who demanded as reward the sun and moon and the goddess Freya for his wife. Everyone wants Freya for their wife. Everyone. The gods, terrified by the rapid progress of the work, forced Loki, who had advised the bargain, to delay the giant by a trick, so that the footnote, page 12, work was not finished in the stipulated time. <clears throat> How to get out of an oath. Call Loki. The enraged giant then threatened the gods, whereupon Thor slew him. Oath's bride, Freya. Of Oath little is known beyond the fact that Snorri refers to him as a man who went away on long journeys. That is the end for today. I will see you next time. The Valuspa. Stanzas 26 to 30. 26. In swelling rage, then rose up Thor. Seldom he sits when he hears such things. And the oaths were broken, the words and bonds, the mighty pledges between them made. 27. I know of the horn of Heimdall hidden under the high-reaching holy tree. On it there pours from Valfather's pledge a mighty stream. Would you know more yet? 28. Alone I sat when the old one sought me, the terror of gods, and gazed in mine eyes. What hast thou to ask? Why comest thou hither? Odin, I know where thine eye is hidden. I know where Odin's eye is hidden, deep in the wide-famed well of Mimir. Mead from the pledge of Odin each mum does Mimir drink. Would you know yet more? 29. Necklaces had I and rings from her father. Wise was my speech and my magic wisdom widely I saw over all the worlds. 30. On all sides saw I Valkyries assemble ready to ride to the ranks of the gods. Skuld bore the shield and Skogel rolled next. 
Guth, Hild, Gondol, Gireskogel, of Herajan's mains, maidens. The list have ye heard. Valkyries ready to ride o'er the earth. 26. Thor, the thunder god, son of Odin, and Jorth, earth, particularly Harperslothjoth and Thrymskvitha, Passum, oaths, etc. The gods, by violating their oaths to the giant who rebuilt Asgard, aroused the undying hatred of the giant's race, and thus the giants were among their enemies in the final battle. 27. Here the vulva turns from her memories of the past to a statement of some of Othan's own secrets in his eternal search for knowledge. Stanzas 27 to 29. Bug reports this stanza after stanza 29, the horn of Heimdall, the Gjallar horn, Shrieking horn, with which Heimdall watchmen of the gods will summon them to the last battle. Till that time the horn is buried under Yildrasil, Valfather's pledge, Othan's eye, the sun, which he gave to the water spirit, Mimir or Mim, in exchange for the latter's wisdom. It appears here and in stanza 29 as a drinking vessel from which Mimir drinks the magic mead and from which he pours water on the ash of Yildrasil. Uthan's sacrifice of his one eye in order to gain knowledge of his final doom is one of the series of disasters leading up to the destruction of the gods. There were several differing versions of the story of Uthan's relations with Mimir. Another one, quite incompatible with this, appears in stanza 47. In the manuscripts I know and I see appear as she knows and she sees. CF note on 21. 28. The Hawksbrook version omits all of stanzas 28 to 34. Stanzas 27 being there followed by stanzas 40 and 41. Regis indicates stanzas 28 and 29 as a single stanza. Bug puts stanza 28 after stanza 22 as the second stanza of his reconstructed poem. The vulva here addresses Odin directly, intimating that, although he has not told her, she knows why he has come to her and what he has already suffered in his search for knowledge regarding his doom. Her reiterated, would you know yet more, seems to mean I have proved my wisdom by telling of the past and of your own secrets. It is your will that I tell likewise of the fate in store for you. The old one, Othin. The line, I know where Othin's eye is hidden. Not in either manuscript is a conjectural emendation based on Snorri's paraphrase. Bug puts this stanza after stanza 20. 29. This is apparently the trans transitional stanza in which the vulva, rewarded by Odin for her knowledge of the past, stanzas 1 through 29, is induced to proceed with her real prophecy, stanzas 31 through 66. Some editors turn the stanza into the third person, making it a narrative link. Bug, on the other hand, puts it, footnote P14, after stanza 28 as the third stanza of the poem. No lacuna is indicated in the manuscripts and editors have attempted various emendations. Here, father, father of the host, Uthen. 30. Valkyries. These choosers of the slain, CF stanza 1, wrote, note, bring the bravest warriors killed in battle to Valhall in order to reinforce the gods for their final struggle. They are also called wish maidens, as the fulfillers of Odin's wishes. 
The conception of the nat supernatural warrior maiden was presumably brought to Scandinavia in the very early times from the South Germanic races. And later it was woven with the likewise South Germanic tradition of the Swan Maiden. A third complication developed when the original, originally quite human woman of the hero legends were endowed with the qualities of both Valkyries and Swan Maidens. As in the cases of Brunhild, C.F. Grip Pispo, Introductory Note, Zvava, C.F. Helgatvita, Hjörvarthur, Hjörvarthusunar, prose after standa five and a note, and Sigrun, Helga Kvitha, Hundingsbanna, 17 and note. The list of names here given may be an interpolation. A quite different list is given in Gr Grimnismo, 36. Ranks of the gods. Some editors regard the word thus translated as a specific place name. Herhan, leader of hosts. Uthin. It is worth noting that the name Hild, warrior, is the basis of Brunhild, warrior in male coat. That is the end of this one. And join me for the next. Thank you. Voluspa. Stanzas 31 through 40. 31. I saw for Baldur, the bleeding god, the son of Othin, his destiny set, famous and fair, in the lofty fields, full grown in strength, the mistletoe stood. 32. From the branch which seemed so slender and fair came a harmful shaft that Hoth should hurl. But the brother of Baldur was born ere long, and one night old fought Odin's son. 33. His hands he washed not, his hair he combed not, till he bore to the bale blaze Baldur's foe. But in Finselir did Frigg weep sore for Valhall's need. Would you know Yet more. 34. Then did Valley Slaughter Bonds twist. Made fairly grim were those fetters of guts. 35. One did I see in the wet woods bound, a lover of ill unto Loki like. By his side does Sigyn sit, nor is glad to see her mate. Would you know yet more? 32. Baldur, the death of Baldur, the son of Odin and Frigg, was the first of the great disasters to the gods. The story is fully told by Snorri. Frigg had demanded of all created things, saving only the mistletoe, which she thought too weak to be worth troubling. Footnote P15. About. An oath that they would not harm Baldur. Thus it came to he a sport for the gods to hurl weapons at Baldur, who of course was totally unharmed thereby. Loki, the troublemaker, brought the mistletoe to Baldur's blind brother Hoth, and guided his hand in hurling the twig. Baldur was slain, and grief came upon all the gods, C.F. Baldur's drummer. The lines in this and the following stanza have been combined in various ways by editors, lacunae having been freely conjectured. But the manuscript version seems clear enough. The brother of Baldur, Vali, whom Othin begot expressly to avenge Baldur's death. The day after his birth he fought and slew Hoth. 33. Frigg, Othin's wife. Some scholars have regarded her as a solar myth calling her the sun goddess, and pointing out that her home in Finselir, the sea holes, symbolizes the daily setting of the sun beneath the ocean horizon. 35. The translation here follows the Regis version. The Hawks book 
has the same final two lines, but in place of the first footnote P16, Per has, I know that Vali, his brother Nod, with his bowels then, was Loki bound. Many editors have followed this version of the whole stanza or have included these two lines when marking them as doubtful, with the four from Regis. After the murder of Baldur, the gods took Loki and bound him to a rock with the bowels of his son Narfi, who had just been torn to pieces by Loki's other son, Vali. A serpent was fastened to above Loki's head, and the venom fell upon his face. Loki's wife Sigyn sat by him with a basin to catch the venom, but whenever the basin was full and she went away to empty it, then the venom fell on Loki again till the earth shook with his struggles, and there he lies, bound till the end. CF Lokasena, concluding prose. That is the end. Join me for the next. Navaluspa, 36 through 40. 36. From the east there pours through poisoned veils, with swords and daggers, the silver slith. 37. Northward a hall, in Nith Valier, of gold there rose for Sindri's race, and in Oak Mill another stood, there the giant Brimir his beer hall had. 38. A hall I saw, far from the sun, on Nastrand it stands, and the doors face north. Venom drops, through the smoke vent down, for around the halls two serpents wind. 39. I saw their wading through rivers wild, treacherous men, and murderers too. The workers of ill with the wives of men, where Nithog sucked the blood of the slain, and the wolf tore men, would you know yet more? 40. The giantess old in Ironwood sat in the east and bore the brood of Finrir. Among these one in monster's guise was soon to steal the sun from the sky. 36. Stanzas 36 through 39 describe the homes of the enemies of the gods. The giants, 36. The dwarfs, 37. And the dead in the land of the goddess Hell, 38 through 39. The Hawksbook version omits stanzas 36 and 37. Rigis unites 36 with 37. But most editors have assumed a lacuna. Slith. The fearful, a river and the giant's home, the swords and daggers may represent the icy cold. Nithvalir, the dark fields, a home of the dwarfs, perhaps the word should be Nith, Nithafjol, the dark crags. Sindri, the great worker in gold among the dwarfs, Okolnir, footnote P17, the not cold possibly a volcano, Brimir the giant, possibly Ymir, out of whose blood, according to stanza 9, the dwarfs were made. The name here appears to mean simply the leader of the dwarfs. 38. Stanzas 38 and 39 follow stanza 43 in the Hawksburg version. Snorri quotes stanzas 39, 40 and 41, though not consecutively. Nastrond, Corpse Strand, the land of the dead, ruled by the goddess Hell. Here the wicked undergo tortures. Smoke vent, the phrase gives a picture of the Icelandic house with its opening in the roof serving as a chimney. 39. The stanza is almost certainly in corrupt form. The third line is presumably an interpolation and is lacking in the most of the late paper manuscripts. Some editors, however, have called lines 1 to 3 the remains of a full stanza, with the fourth line lacking 
and lines four through five the remains of another. The stanza depicts the torments of the two worst classes of criminals known to Old Norse morality, oath breakers and murderers. Nithog, the dread biter, the dragon that lies beneath the ash reeled Yildrasil and gnaws at its roots, thus symbolizing the destructive elements in the universe. C. F. Grimm's Nismo, 32-35, the wolf, presumably the wolf Fenrir, one of the children of Loki and the giantess Angrabota, the others being Mithgarstrom and the goddess Hel, who was chained by the gods with who was chained by the gods with the marvelous chain Glebnir, fashioned by a dwarf out of six things. Footnote P eighteen Noise of a cat step, the beards of women, the roots of mountains, the nerves of bears, the breath of fishes, and the spittle of birds. The chaining of Fenrir cost the god Tyr his right hand. CF stanza forty four. 40. The Hawks Book version inserts after stanza 39 the refrain stanza 44 and puts stanzas 40 and 41 between 27 and 21. With this stanza begins the account of the final struggle itself. The giantess, her name is nowhere stated and the only other reference to Ironwood is in Grimnismo 39 in this same connection. The children of this giantess and the wolf Finrir are the wolves Skull and Hati, the first of whom steals the sun, the second the moon. Some scholars naturally see here an eclipse myth. That is all. I will see you for the next one. Voluspa 56 through 60. 56. In anger smites the warder of earth. Forth from their homes must all men flee. Nine paces fares the son of Fjorgen. Unslain by the serpent, fearless he sinks. 57. The sun turns black, earth sinks in the sea. The hot stars down from heaven are whirled. Fierce grows the stream and the life feeding flame till the fire leaps high about heaven itself. 58. Now Garm howls loud before Gennepre Heller. The fetters will burst and the wolf run free. Much do I know and more can see of the fates of the gods, the mighty in fight. 59. Now do I see the earth anew rise all green from the waves again. The cataracts fall and the eagle flies, the fish he catches beneath the cliffs. 60. The gods in eat fall meet together of the terrible girdler. Of earth they talk, and the mighty past they call to mind, and the ancient runes of the ruler of gods. 56. The warder of earth, Thor, the son of Fjorkin, again footnote P24, Thor who after slaying the serpent is overcome by his venomous breath and dies. Fjorgen appears in both a masculine and a feminine form. In the masculine, one T is a name for Othin. In the feminine, as here and in Harbarthsjolth 56, it appears to refer to Jorth. 57. With this stanza, the account of the destruction. 58. Again the refrain stanza, CF stanza 44 and note, abbreviated in both manuscripts. As in the case of stanza 49, it is probably misplaced here. 59. Here begins the description of the new world which is to rise out of the wreck of the old one. It is on this passage that a few critics have sought to base their argument that the poem is later than the introduction of Christianity, circa 1000. But this theory has never seemed convincing. CF introductory note. 60. The third line of this stanza is not found in Rigas. Ithavol, 
CF stanza 7 and note, the girdler of earth, myth Garstorm. Footnote P25, who lying in the sea surrounded the land. The ruler of gods, Uthin. The runes were both magic signs, generally carved on wood and sung or spoken charms. That is the end of this set. Join me for the next. Voluspa. Stanza 61 through 66. 61. In wondrous beauty, once again shall the golden table, tables stand mid the grass which the gods had owned in the days of old. 62. Then fields unsowed, bear ripened fruit, all ills grow better, and Baldur comes back. Baldur and Hoth dwell in Hrupt's battle hall. And the mighty gods, would you know yet more? 63. Then Honir wins, the prophetic wand, and the sons of the brothers of Tveki abide in Vandaheim now. Would you know yet more? 64. More fair than the sun, a hall I see roofed with gold. On Gimli it stands. There shall the righteous rulers dwell, and happiness ever there shall have they have. 65. There comes on high all power to hold, a mighty lord all lands he rules. 66. From below the dragon, dark comes forth, Nithug flying from Nithavyo. The bodies of men on his wings he bears, the serpent bright, but now must I sink. <coughs> 61. The Hawksburg version of the first two lines runs, The gods shall find there wondrous fair, the golden tables amid the grass. No lacuna, line 4, is indicated in the manuscripts. Golden tables, CF stanza 8 and note. 62. Baldur, CF stanza 32 and note. Baldur and his brother Hoth, who unwittingly slew him at Loki's instigation, returned together, their union being a symbol of the new age of peace. Hropt, another name for Othin, his battle hall is Valhall. 63. No lacuna, line 2. Indicated in the manuscripts, Honir, CF stanza 18 and note. In this new age, he has the gift of foretelling the future. Tvegi, the twofold, another name for Othin. His brothers are Vili and Ve. CF Lokasena, 26 and note. Little is known of them and nothing beyond this reference of their sons. Windheim, home of the wind, heaven. 64. This stanza is quoted by Snorri. Gimli. Snorri makes this name of the hall itself, where here it appears to refer to a mountain on which the hall stands. It is the home of the happy as opposed to another hall, not here mentioned for the dead. Snorri's description of this second hall is based on Voluspo 38, which he quotes, and perhaps that stanza properly belongs after 64. 65. This stanza is not found in Regis, and is probably spurious. No lacuna is indicated in the Hoxburg version, but late paper manuscripts add two lines running rule he orders, and rights he fixes, laws he ordains, that ever shall live. The name of this new ruler is nowhere given, and of course, the suggestion of Christianity is unavoidable. It is not certain, however, that this, even this stanza, refers to Christianity, and if it does, it may have been interpolated long after the rest of the poem was composed. 66. This stanza, which fits so badly with the preceding ones, footnote P27, may well have been interpolated. It has been suggested that the dragon, making a last attempt to rise, is destroyed, this event marking the end of evil in the world. 
but in both manuscripts the final half line does not refer to the dragon, but as the gender shows to the vulva herself, who sinks into the earth, a sort of conclusion to the entire prophecy. Presumably the stanza barring the last half line, which was probably intended as the conclusion of the poem, belongs somewhere in the description of the great struggle. Nithog, the dragon at the roots of Yltrasil, CF stanza 39 and note. Nithafio, the dark crags, nowhere else mentioned. Must I, the manuscripts have must she. That is the end of our reading of the Voluspa with the analysis. I hope you have enjoyed this. Please sub and share my channel to those you think might benefit. I now have memberships available and you can support my channel for just one dollar. I appreciate the time that you spend with me. Upcoming, I am working on Beowulf and will release a deep dive into earth goddesses from all over the world. Thanks again and have a great day. Mm -hmm.